Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews, where we feel no shame in our love for vampires. No shame. We discuss a tentpole of the vampire genre. The first novel in Laurel K. Hamilton's Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series, Guilty Pleasures. In the 2000s, Marvel put out a comics edition of the first three books in the series, and though they're not great as comics, they stick pretty close to the books, kind of word for word, so if you prefer a visual medium. Anita Blake is a 24-year-old necromancer, or professionally, an animator. She has the magic power to raise zombies from their graves, and she uses her powers as a consultant for the police to help solve crimes. She's also occasionally a vampire slayer, killing vampires legally for the cops once they break the law. In her world, vampires have been public knowledge for a couple of years and incorporated with society. The series focuses on the socio-political impact that has in the world, but mostly on Anita's hometown of St. Louis. There are a lot of murders that need solving, and even though Anita's not technically a private eye, she often ends up on the case. Guilty Pleasures came out in 1993 and launched the groundbreaking urban fantasy series that is still going to this day. The 26th book in the series is coming out this summer. The author started the series when she was only 24 years old and has many years ahead of her and no plans to stop. After 25 years and 26 novels, three short stories and three novellas all centered on and narrated by the same vampire hunter character, Anita Blake and her world have undergone some changes. In fact, this series has quite a reputation. So much so that the overwhelming popular derision surrounding it deterred even me, your maven, from picking it up until now, despite how important it is to my beloved vampire genre. You see, back in 1993, urban fantasy as a genre didn't exist. Well, we've discussed urban fantasy before, if you need a refresher. It's a relatively new literary genre that exploded onto the scene in the late 90s and early 2000s. But back when Hamilton was trying to get this book published, it was rejected over 200 times because nobody in the industry knew what it was or where it fit. Everyone thought it was someone else's baby, she says. The horror people thought it was science fiction. The science fiction people thought it was fantasy. The fantasy people thought it was mystery. Mystery people wouldn't touch it because it had monsters in it. The horror people didn't like it because my vampires were out of the closet. I was one of the first, if not the first, to mainstream my vampires. Not only was Hamilton one of the first to combine genres, but she did it with a female protagonist. And that's important. If you look at urban fantasy now, 25 years later, and its spin-off genre paranormal romance, it is a largely female-led industry. Many urban fantasy authors to this day cite Hamilton as a chief influence in their work. But even Jim Butcher, whose Dresden Files have been declared the gold standard of the urban fantasy genre. Because if a man's writing in a female-led genre, of course he's the gold standard. He credits Hamilton's Anita Blake as his inspiration. But Anita isn't just a female protagonist, no. She's not like the other girls. <sighs> okay, so anytime someone tries to call this book horror, Hamilton is quick to correct them that it is a mystery first and not some cozy Miss Marple lady mystery. It is a hard boiled detective novel and don't you forget it. And she talks about how she was reading a lot of this kind of fiction back in the day, and they did have female detectives sometimes, but there was one problem, a difference between the male and female protagonists of the different series. Even the strongest of the women did not get to do the same things the men got to do. The men got to cuss, the women rarely. 
The men got to kill people and not feel bad about it. If the women killed someone, they had to feel really, really bad about it afterwards, and it had to be an extreme situation. The men got to have sex, often, and on stage, and very casually. But if the women had sex, it had to be off stage, very sanitized. I thought this was unfair. So I wanted a heroine who would be as tough as the men or tougher, who would be able to address all these issues, and I wanted to strike a blow for equality. And yes, please, thank you. The fact that Anita Blake does this is huge and important and influenced so many female protagonists to come. However, Hamilton was 24 when she wrote this book, and her ideas of feminism were a touch immature. It was pretty popular in the early 90s that for a tough action girl to be taken seriously and respected, she had to be one of the guys. She had to shun femininity as if traditionally femme qualities were lesser and undesirable. Therefore, Anita hates things like shopping and makeup and doing her hair. Ugh, how girly, gross. She's into stuffed penguins as a security blanket sort of thing is, oh my god, so ashamed of having such a weakness. Though Hamilton mentions sex in that 2003 interview I just quoted, in Guilty Pleasures, Anita is also quite a judgmental snob. She slut shames any woman who shows interest in sex, much less has it. Though Anita has some flirtations with a couple of men in the book, she is actively averse to any sexual relationships because of how promiscuous these guys are. Anita is not like the other girls to be seduced by these Casanovas, especially not the vampires. How cheap does a girl have to be to fall for a vampire? Ugh. They may be super hot and oh my god so sexy, but Anita is not interested. She's also rather homophobic whenever a woman flirts with her. When observing other women, she fat shames, cleavage shames, age shames, hair dye shames. She's got a lot of internalized misogyny she needs to work on. Though it's not a bad thing to have a flawed protagonist, especially when she's got 26 books and counting to work on growing as a person, this can be really uncomfortable to read. Hamilton admits herself that these weren't intentional flaws, but instead mistakes of her narrow-minded youth. In this book, Anita doesn't drink or smoke or have lovers ever. She says grace over her meals. She believes in God because Christianity has been proven to be real with the way that crosses and holy water affect vampires, so it's not blind faith, but she really comes off as a holier-than-thou goody-goody. But over the years since this, Anita changes a lot, especially in regards to sex. And this is where the book's torrid reputation comes in. If you ask anyone now to categorize this series, they won't call it mystery. They'll call it straight-up porn. And don't you know it's popular and trendy to shit on porn designed for women? Ugh, anything women-like is stupid. Hamilton admits that she may have gone a little far in the direction of sexual liberation and equality, but it's her series. She writes what she wants to write. Many of her previously loyal fans hated the way she changed Anita and the tone of the series. And Hamilton says she understands why they feel betrayed, but she has to be true to the growth and change she wants to write. She's still got enough of a ravenous following who loves the new direction of fetishy rape fantasy erotica. And she has years and years of Anita's sexcapade stories left to tell. If you're not the audience for it, don't read it. But in this book, Anita's very beginnings, she is grumpy and judgmental and sarcastic and mean. You either like her snippy, sarcastic personality, or you pretty much can't stand her. Back in 1993, she was a fresh take on female protagonists, and many loved her for it. Reading her now for the first time 25 years later, well, I guess I missed the boat on having my mind blown. But this is a vampire review. Let's talk about the vampires.
Despite Anita's world being a supernatural kitchen sink full of zombies, ghouls, were-creatures of every species, were-rats feature heavily in this book, and all kinds of other things, vampires are the focus. In Guilty Pleasures, vampires reach out to Anita for help. Someone is murdering the most powerful vampires in town, and they think only Anita can solve it. She doesn't want to help them because she hates vampires, so they blackmail her by threatening her human friend. Jean-Claude is a sexy, powerful vampire who runs the local vampire strip club, who always wears lacy, ruffly shirts. But they need to make sure to point out that on him, they look masculine. Mm -hmm. Just like another vampire is too masculine to be called beautiful, definitely no homo in these romance novel cover vampires, no sir. Though Jean-Claude has a soft spot for Anita because she's not like the other girls and for some reason she's immune to some of his powers and that makes her special, he's forced by his vampire superiors to make her obey. To help her out, he gives her vampire marks, which is a transfer of some of his powers to make her more resilient against the other vampires. However, he does this without Anita's consent, and it's the first steps to binding her to him as a human servant, so she is not pleased. His vampire boss is also not pleased, so Jean-Claude gets locked up and punished, and he's actually not in most of the novel. Jean-Claude and the male vampires at his strip club are rather cliche in the romance novel vampire trope way. And even though Anita's repulsed by her undeniable attraction to them, she makes sure the reader understands just how hot and sexy they are. The book isn't called Guilty Pleasures for nothing. In a world where vampires interact with the human mainstream, of course they would be commodified for human pleasure, because that's what humans do. The vampire strip show offers a safe form of terror, like a haunted house theme park. And it opens with a speech about how the vampires need the humans and can't live without them. It makes the humans feel special and important even as the vampires take from them. But despite their seductiveness, these vampires are genuinely frightening. They're a lot more monstrous and violent than you'd ever see in a romance novel. They switch from seductive Casanova to cold inhuman beast like flipping a switch in an utterly alien way. Though being bitten by them is painful, they usually don't kill people to drink their blood. What terrifies Anita is their mind control powers. Anita is especially afraid of losing control of her senses, of being under any power or influence other than her own. She never drinks alcohol for this reason. She must be in control of her mind and body at all times. The vampire's hypnotic powers are her greatest nightmare. And she never makes eye contact, but they still sometimes can get to her. Jean-Claude's marks give her the ability to resist the mind control, but the fact that he did it without her consent still triggers her fear of helplessness. Toward the climax of the book, she says it outright. I hate being helpless. I hate it. Her friend replies, you're one of the least helpless people I know. And it's true. Anita is a tiny little woman in a man's world. She makes sure to constantly remind us how short she is and how small her waist is. But she compensates for this female helplessness by working hard to make herself be as kick-ass as possible. With big weapons and an even bigger attitude. And yet... No matter how powerful she is in the human world, compared to a vampire, she's as helpless as a baby. And that is the ultimate terror. One vampire tells her, I can make you do whatever I want. The most powerful vampires are even called masters. And though powerlessness, forced subservience, enslavement is a universal fear, it is especially a woman's fear in a patriarchal society. Especially when all these vampire men are so sexy that a part of Anita wants to succumb to them, and she hates that part of herself. She is in torment. Such a feminist dilemma. The only person in the book smaller and more feminine than Anita is the vampire big boss Nicholas, who looks like a 12-year-old girl. She's 1,000 years old and the most powerful thing Anita's ever met, capable of shredding her mind. 
Because she's not a sexy man, there are no gray areas with Nicholas. Anita is completely repulsed by her and terrified of her. She's a black and white sadistic monster, nothing gray or complex about her. And even though she's the one who hired Anita to solve the murders, there's no point where we're not convinced that she'll kill Anita the second the mystery solved. Nicholas's appearance as a small, innocent, defenseless girl is just as terrifying to Anita as the ironic super vampire power she possesses. She looks like everything Anita never wants to be. Anita wants to slay this representative of abusive enslavement and control as well as that very image of weakness. So when Anita kills Nicholas at the end of the book using her snarky wits and a sword that is so big she can barely even lift it in her tiny lady arms, she strikes a triumph for anyone who's ever felt helpless or subjugated. She doesn't use magic to slay Nicholas, just brute force, raw human strength and luck. Anita is spraying blood and guts and gore everywhere. Whenever a vampire knows of her reputation as a slayer, they call her ominously the executioner. When Jean-Claude finds out how many vampires she's slain, he says, and you call us murderers. We get a bit of that old theme of when does the monster killer become the monster herself? Anita's emotional struggle with this blurry line is compelling. She starts out with an immature 24 year old black and white point of view that grows grayer and grayer as her story progresses. The book points out a couple of times that Anita is special because unlike how most people run from what scares them, she races toward it. She wants to dominate her fears. She's a vampire hunter because she's so terrified of them. In a 2014 interview, Hamilton said, life has always seemed like a battle to me, fighting for what's right, what is yours, what you want, what you need, and what you want to accomplish. If a successful, happy life were easy, everyone would have one, and they don't. You've got to work for it and work through things to succeed and be happy. And she puts a lot of herself in her characters. Anita's battle is for complete self-control, utter uninhibited autonomy, and the vampire here represents the opposite of that. The only main vampire that's not dead by the end of the story is Jean-Claude, and Anita is not happy with how he abused her consent, despite her conflicting interest in him. As the series goes on, they become lovers, and the themes of consent are explored much more thoroughly. And the question of whether Anita is as much a monster as the vampires grows even deeper. See, she eventually gains these sexy powers that force her to be the perpetrator of some serious dub con framed for titillation. It's all written as quite the guilty pleasure. Or so I've heard. This is the only book I've actually read myself. And I'm glad I read it. I appreciate what it did for the vampire genre, but it did not age well. And you know what? I think I'm good. As far as continuing the series goes, no thanks. I can benefit now from the rewards of the authors who stood on Laurel K. Hamilton's shoulders and expanded the urban fantasy genre into what it's become today. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and if vampire strippers are your cup of blood, more power to you. I prefer my vampires with their clothes on. The more capes, the better. More capes! patron who requested this knew what he was getting me into. Thank you to my Patreon patrons for supporting these videos. If you want to request that I review something else, join my Patreon. Please don't request that I review any more in this series because then I would actually have to do it. Don't you love me? If you can't join my Patreon, just like this video, leave me a comment, subscribe to my channel, click the alert bell so you actually get my updates, and be one with the night, whether you like your vampires clothed or stripped with capes.